higher and higher oh since I laid my burdens down oh burdens down Lord burdens down Lord since I laid my burdens down oh burdens down Lord burdens down Lord since I laid my burdens down Amen our scripture lesson tonight will come from Romans Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9 it says if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved for it is with the heart that you believe and you are justified and it is with the mouth that you profess your faith and are saved as the scripture says anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame let us bow in a word of prayer Heavenly Father how we thank you again tonight to come before these your people with a word from you and to lift up and magnify your holy name we love you and we honor you tonight above all else and so God tonight even at this late hour we want to continue to give you the praise and continue to brag upon your love for us that you saved our souls while we were yet sinners and we thank you for that so now Lord have your way spirit of the living God fall fresh in Jesus name amen of God said amen. amen we want to make ready to give as unto the Lord we realize that we have just concluded one opportunity to receive and to experience God's favor and his grace being abundantly poured out into our lives because the word teaches us that whatever we have we're simply sowing seeds we're simply making investments into the kingdom of God. There is an amazing, in my estimation, passage of scripture found in the book of Kings. A story is told about a widow of Zarephath and how the man of God, Elijah, was sent to her home and she was preparing to eat her last and she and her son were going to eat and die. But Elijah said to her, feed me and make me a cake first. That, that seems to be idiotic and it seems to be unreasonable from a humanistic perspective. And I wondered why on earth would God uh, give Elijah the command to tell the widow to feed him first and then the woman and the son human mindset would have reversed the order we would have fed the child first then the woman then the man but when I looked carefully at the passage I discovered that the reason God established that order was because he wanted Elijah to eat from what the woman had, which was very little, so that the woman and her son could eat from what he would provide. Elijah got a lunch, but the widow and the woman got groceries for a lifetime. And one of the things that we do when it's giving time we often hold on to our lunch money and we deny ourselves groceries that are free from heaven for the rest of our lives. And so it's giving time. And if the Lord has blessed you to be able to sow, I'm going to begin this offering tonight with $100 and as many as can share with me, I want to encourage you to do so. If you have that seed, thank you, Pastor Lewis. I'm 
planting my hundred dollar seed or whatever your best seed is I would ask that you would bring it even now it's if it's 50 if it's 20 whatever that amount is if you would bring it as unto the Lord and to know that the God we serve will never allow you to give him your lunch money without he also providing whatever grocery money you need and when you look carefully at that story you'll also discover that the woman gave Elijah her poverty so that God could give her his plenty and often we make the mistake of holding on to our poverty and we deny ourselves of God's plenty if you're here and you have that gift bring it even now as we sow seeds into the kingdom of God whatever your best seed is bring it even now amen have we all had an opportunity to give if so let's pray Lord we thank you now for these gifts and we thank you for the givers we pray that they might be used for the purpose of which they have been given we thank you for the seeds that have been sown the sacrifices that have been made multiply even now in Jesus name amen Shall we say a great amen? amen. Let's say amen again. Amen. What a privilege it is at this late hour to be able to do what prior to Sunday I would not have been able to do at this level. Uh, I would have said yes because it's better uh, to say yes to an invitation to share all I would have been able to do was simply read what someone would have given me but since Sunday I can say more than what someone has given me the fact that you're here at this late hour tells me that you still believe that God moves in mysterious ways as wonders to perform and I say that Chairman Simpson let me acknowledge you the absence of our Executive Secretary Woods, our President, Dr. Talbot, the members of this Evangelical Board, that this past Sunday, uh, your Executive Secretary, Pastor Timothy Woods, was to be with us at Macedonia, as uh, we always do, not just Macedonia, but across the country when uh, pastors are coming to the city, some of us open our pulpits provide opportunity for those who are coming early to be a blessing to us. Pastor Woods was to be with us and he texted me uh, late last week to say circumstances would prevent him from coming, but he didn't end it with that. He said, Jerry, based upon our friendship, I'm going to ask you to still keep your pulpit open and allow a certain preacher to come and share with the Macedonia church. In fact, he's scheduled to preach the late night on Wednesday. I had not met this preacher, had not talked with him, but called him, loved the conversation, loved his spirit. When he came to Macedonia, I loved his spirit even more. We didn't know the relationships that we had at that time, relationship that he has with a number of pastors that are friends and much beloved brothers, Charles Booth, Joe Ratcliffe, Ralph West, I mean, the list goes on. Needless to say, relationship with my own son-in-law. And so he stood and my God, did he stand. It was courtesy extended to a friend to open the door. But after Sunday, we don't need that friend to call. Macedonia already knows that he'll be back. Dr. T, Dr. 
Grant Malone told him the relationship. He is from England. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. He's been preaching since he was nine years old. He's preached across this country. And believe it or not, he's a Seventh Day Adventist. But my God, is he a preacher? And when I heard him, I became excited about what God was doing in his life and his ministry. Pastor Brackens, I get excited when I see all these prepared, passionate, young pastors and the relationship that they have one with the other. It means something. I pray they keep those relationships and continue to be brothers one to the other. But he's here in the last service of this convention regardless to how able the preacher is in the pulpit. How many of you would agree there needs to be some able prayer warriors in the pew? Because preaching and praying still to go together. Late Dr. William Augustus Jones Jr. always said, in a time such as we live, when trumpets are needed, flutes won't suffice. I want to tell you today, we don't have a flutist. We have a trumpeter. And he's going to come and bless us with the word from the Lord. This able giant in the ministry, Pastor Laron St. Clair Grosvenor, proud esteemed pastor of the Alpha Seventh Day Adventist Church in Austin, Texas. We welcome him here. And we want you to say amen. As our minister of music leads us in a hymn of preparation, the next voice you will hear is Pastor Grosvenor. Would you elevate your hands as a token of respect for God's man for such a time as this? Amen. Yeah. 
emotions and our intellect. In Jesus' name, Jesus name. Amen. amen. How honored I am to share on this night. We do thank God for this opportunity to be here and to be with one and all to our highly esteemed president, President Tolbert, and to our secretary, Dr. Dixon, to this wonderful host, Pastor Dr. Kemp, and to my friend, my brother, uh, Dr. Timothy Woods. We thank God for all of you. If you have your Bibles tonight, the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6. Beginning at verse 1. Reading from the New King James Version, you may follow in your own Bibles. In the New King James Version, you will invariably find these words. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, that there were no bricks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villagers in the plain of Odom. But they thought to do me mischief. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I'm doing a great work. Yes that I could not come down. Why should the word cease while I leave it and go down to you? For they sent me this message four times. I answered them in the same manner. And Sambalat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. In it was written and was reported among the nations and Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. You have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king, so come, therefore, and let us consult together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. They all were trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. I want to preach for the next few moments. Please stop pressuring me. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, please stop pressuring me. Turn to your other neighbor and say, other neighbor, oh, other neighbor, please stop pressuring me. Harriet Tubman, that prolific abolitionist, also alias as the Black Moses, humanitarian, best known for her courageous efforts to free slaves. Tubman had been beaten and physically abused by masters. On one occasion, she's hit by a metal object, suffers from seizures and narcoleptic attacks. In other words, she would pass out unexpectedly. One time she was on a rescue mission and the story is that she passed out underneath a wanted poster with her picture and her name on it. She never got caught, never lost a passenger, became a spy for the Union Army. How do you do all of that? Never get caught, never lose a passenger, become a federal spy despite this weak spot in her health. She testified the reason I could do what I did despite my weak spot was because while I was conscious, I was working for the Lord, so that when I was unconscious, the Lord was working for me. Uh, Isn't it good news, my friends? The deep reality is we are all here at 10.04 tonight, because not because of the church we leave, car we drive, the house on the prairie that we live in, but because of God's matchless grace. Yes. Worked on us, in us, through us, and for us. Every disappointment, every care, every breakup, every relationship, every hurdle, every blessing was God working on our behalf. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the greatest destroyers you can ever allow into your life and your mission and your raison d'etre is pressure. Pressure will cause you to do things that you don't want to do. Pressure will have you not doing things you know you ought to do. Pressure will cause you to hang out with some folk you know don't mean you any good. What separates each and every one of us tonight in this context is not that some have to deal with pressure and some don't. 
But what separates us tonight in this context is that not everybody deals with pressure in the same way. And if you agree with that, then you're already in the text tonight because there's no doubt about it. Nehemiah, who is the pivotal personality of this particular passage, is in a pressurized predicament. Yeah. He learns of the destruction of his people. Jerusalem is going through great affliction. The wall has been broken down. It's in dire need of rebuilding. Nehemiah weeps, he mourns, he fasts, he laments, he prays. Why? Because he is convicted that his city needs his help. Yes. All right. Nehemiah has had a successful life and now occupies the position as the king's cupbearer. And it allows him in and out of the presence of the king. But as he's back and forth, the king notices that Nehemiah's countenance is sad. Notices that Nehemiah isn't serving with the same joy or the same peace with which he normally serves. And so Nehemiah asks the king to give him a sabbatical while he goes and personally rebuilds for his people what has prior been destroyed. Oh, he does not take a lease off there, a hands off approach, nor he goes and personally serves the people of which he is a part. He does not anticipate a perfunctory effort. This is not going to be easy work because his people are in trouble. In them, hope unborn had died. All right. <laughs> Nehemiah has a vision to revive the place and revive the people because where there is no vision, my friends, the people will always perish. Yeah. Yeah. So Nehemiah's people are perishing, but they've not yet perished. And I've lived long enough to know that just in between the space of perishing and perish, there's just enough space for a vision that can rescue the perishing and care for them. Do I have a witness here? So after some highs and some lows and some pleasing progression, Nehemiah is almost finished. The responsibilities have not weakened him. Formidable foes have not deterred him. Nehemiah has ever encouraged the people that God has, God is, and God would continue to bless their efforts. So here at the center of the scene of the text, all that is left is that the gates would be set in place. Yeah. However, somebody shout, however. however. Those that never wanted to see this day from the very beginning have not yet given up. Because there will always be a few people that will be disgruntled at your success and they'll be mad at your progression. The Bible declares that Sambalat and Geshem want to lure him down from the wall. They want to lure him to a place called, oh no. And so the tension that is replete in the text tonight at 10.08 in the evening is that the work God has for you will not always be met with appreciation, ovation, gratitude, honor, or applause. And so the relevant question tonight is, how in the world do I deal with the pressure from those that cannot deal with what God is doing in my life? Because, because there are some stuff you are called to build while simultaneously facing concretized and cemented opposition. Oh, man. So first thing, text tells that if you're going to deal with pressure, you need discernment. Yeah. Somebody shout discernment. Yeah. Nehemiah has the spirit of discernment. Nehemiah has the discernment to see the scorn beneath their smile. He knows exactly what these antagonists are trying to do. And I've lived long enough to know that if we are ever going to survive in this antagonistic, pressure-filled environment that we've been called to live, to work, to move, to have our being, we must do it wrapped in the discipline of discernment. I need discernment. I don't know about y'all, but I need discernment tonight. I need discernment to know who is for me and who is against me. I need need discernment tonight because I don't have time to be scratching my head wondering who's on my side or not. I need discernment tonight because discernment removes the question marks from people who desire to be a part of the equation of your life. Do I have a witness here? So Nehemiah's enemies have tried distraction, they've tried delay, and now they embark on destruction. Plan is simple but it's deadly. They want to assassinate Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah's death would frustrate the workers so much that the people wouldn't want to complete the work. Uh -huh. So through discernment, Nehemiah says, I'm not going down to their level 
because they're trying to put me down to stop the work. Let, let me illustrate here. Um, if we were to leave church tonight and we went outside and saw a dog outside and the moon in the sky and we saw the dog barking at the moon, it really wouldn't be a story. We could get in our car going back to the hotel. But if we were to walk outside tonight and see the moon barking at the dog, there'd be a big problem. And the lesson this wisdom offering teaches us tonight is stop barking at dogs that lie beneath you. You, you, you're so focused on trying to handle your history, you don't have energy to step into your destiny. Can, 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 can I help you here? President Obama, and I'm sure you know, President Obama has received more death threats than any other president in U.S. history. Is it because he dropped an atomic bomb on Naki Shaki or Hiroshima? No, Truman did that. Is it because he went head first into Vietnam conflicts? No, Eisenhower did that. Is it because he got his suit snagged on the Watergate scandal? No, Nixon did that. Is it because he turned on some Marvin Gaye and messed around with Monica in the heat of the night? No, Clinton did that. Is it because he degrades women and tries to pay them off with hush money and calls Omarosa a dog and calls Don and LeBron intellectually challenged? No, Trump did that. Is it because his skin has been kissed by the son of Africa? Well, I think so. But despite what Obama faced, when you saw him he was not disheveled he was not barking the dogs beneath him no why because he had discernment someone shall discernment and I scratched my head, Dr. Daly. I said, Lord, why in the world are we dealing with this tomfoolery in the White House? And the Lord spoke to me clearly. The Lord said, Laurent, you know what's going on. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but we are dealing with spiritual wickedness. In how do I have a witness here? Yeah. You want to walk in the destiny God has for you, You've got to do it right in the discipline of discernment. Somebody shout discernment. Yes, Second thing the text tale teaches is that if you're going to deal with pressure, you've got to responsibly handle elevated position. Elevated. Nehemiah has experienced elevation in his life. Nehemiah's response to the uh, interrogative, come on down, he says, no, I'm doing a great work. Great work. Can't come down to meet with y'all. Now that's interesting tonight because we've always been taught in Sunday school that the ground at the foot of the cross is equal. But in this season of Nehemiah's life, he has experienced some elevation. Why? Because he used to be the cupbearer. Now cupbearer is a dangerous job because your job is to taste the wine before the king drinks it lest there be some poison in the chalice in attempt to take the life of the king. Being a cupbearer is in fact a respectable position, position of trust that you occupy. But it dawned on me tonight that although cupbearing is respectable, cupbearing is also replaceable. Yes. Perchance the cupbearer, while pre-drinking the king, happens to ingest some poison, some cyanide, whatever it is. My mother always taught me no use in crying over spilled milk. All the king needs to do is find himself another cupbearer. But now in this season of Nehemiah's life, he's experienced some elevation. He's now the manager. He's now the spearhead. And he knows that God is doing a mighty work through his life. There's a whole lot of folk, not in here, a whole lot of folk who are in search of bigger, bigger church, bigger budget. Uh, but God would gladly give some of us bigger and better if he knew we were mature enough to handle bigger and better. Yeah, yeah. There are some of us that struggle to give God glory and praise with the little we have. How do you expect God to entrust you with more if you're not faithful in the few? Right, right. Because the higher you go, the less room there is for mistake. Yeah. On one hand, it's good to learn from your mistakes. Yeah. But on the other hand, you can't live life learning everything by mistake. Oh, yeah. The higher you go, the more you acquire, the more people you are responsible for yeah. is the more responsible you're gonna be for your actions. Yeah. Do I have a witness here? Because God has called all of us to a higher calling. 
we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Uh -huh. But unfortunately, there are some people that do not see life as God sees it. Nor would they live the highest standard God would have them to live. And so let me parenthetically, homiletically, and exegetically park here for a second. Don't let your friends, your family, or your foes determine that you settle down here when God has ordained you to live up here. Do I have a witness here? And I like the words that that hymn writer says, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on. Someone shout higher ground. Got to, you got to choose your friends wisely. Got to pick your battles wisely. Don't got to answer every single question. You have to responsibly handle success, growth, and elevated position. And there has to be some synchronicity with your position and your mentality and behavior. Going to deal with pressure, i got to understand that I need discernment. I need to responsibly handle elevated position. But thirdly and finally, if I'm going to deal with pressure, I've got to refuse to be unproductive. Someone shout, I refuse to be unproductive. I refuse to be unproductive. Nehemiah understands vitriol being spewed out about him. But he's still working. Yeah, still working. Yeah. I'll try that one more time. Yeah. Nehemiah understands the vitriol being spewed out about him. Yeah. But he's still working. Still working. Still working. If y'all shouted amen loud enough, I would have cut the sermon right there. We could have gone home. Let me try it one more time. Nehemiah understands the vitriol being spewed out about him, but he's still working. Yeah, he's still working. The pressure him four times, despite four times he answers in the negative, fifth attempt is made, this unsealed letter is sent to Nehemiah. Their intention was that in transport, the people would pull the letter, read the letter, and start rumors Round the church. Sorry, I mean round the wall. Sambalat wants to pressure the people as the letter gets to Nehemiah. Because I haven't lived long enough to know that if the enemy can't get to you, Dr. Kemp, the enemy will try to get to the people that surround you. So the letter reads, Nehemiah wants to rebel. Nehemiah is getting too big for his boots. And he treats this letter, Dr. Malone, with a hermeneutic of suspicion. He questions the veracity and the truth of the letter. Uh -huh. Nehemiah's response is, there are no such things being done. You have devised them. You have coined them in your own heart. And I'm sad to know, uh, Ralph West, that uh, when you don't give in to pressure, there are some folk that will lie on you to see you destroyed. Do I have a witness here? But you can't lead people and be emotionally swayed by every wave of criticism. Yeah. Look at the stuff that has been destroyed in your life. Relationships that have failed. Jobs you've lost. All because you couldn't deal with the heat of pressure. In fact, the reality is, if you have an assignment on your life, yes. Let me try that again. If you have an assignment on your life, yeah. there are some people that are deployed to assassinate your life. Do I have a witness here? But I've lived long enough to know that if you trust God with your assignment, God will handle your assassin. Do I have a witness here? Nehemiah holds on to this promise because verse 9 shows us they're trying to make him afraid. But they will not succeed. You've got to have faith, my friends, that if God gives you vision, if God puts you where he put you, have faith that no matter the trouble, God will keep you there to produce. Because pain, pressure, fear, hurt, disappointment, and anxiety you can humanly manage will never stretch your faith in God. Yeah, yeah. Some of us can't be productive tonight in our rough seasons because of our inability to release the roughage to God. And so now God is fighting you to let that thing go. And so Nehemiah understands this relevantory and instructive principle. And Nehemiah says, so I pray. Where, where is God keeping you under pressure to prove to you that he's stronger for you 
than you can ever be for yourself. And so watch Nehemiah's prayers I hasten to my seat. Nehemiah does not pray, Lord, take the pain away. Yeah. Nehemiah does not pray, Lord, send some folk to salvage me. Yeah, yeah. Nehemiah understands that God is working on him. But Nehemiah understands that God does not automatically move every obstacle. Nehemiah understands that God will not take you out of the pressure cooker too early, nor will he leave you in there too long. Yeah. Nehemiah prays, Lord, if you won't remove it. Lord, if you won't deplete it. Lord, would you strengthen my hands so I can be strong enough to deal with it? Do I have a witness here? Yeah. Nehemiah understands that uh, the Lord has begun a faithful work in him and is faithful to complete it unto the point of productivity. And through several, several, several months ago, uh, I was on a plane headed to preach uh, somewhere just outside of Philadelphia. And I'm sat at the front of the plane, whatever you call that part, at the front of the plane. And anyone that knows me knows that whenever I fly, one of my biggest frustrations is I'm always seated next to a guy. Always sat next to a, a big, hairy man. And I said this day, Lord, would you allow me to sit next to some perfume and not cologne? Do I have a witness here? And so, and so as I'm sat there in the front of the plane, whatever you call that part, front of the plane, on walks this beautiful woman. I mean, she was bad to the bone. Skin was flawless, hair was flawless, nails done. She had a nice David Yerman bracelet on, nice red bottoms on. And I immediately stopped what I was doing on my iPad, and I went into intercessory prayer, and I said, if there be a God. Why, why, why she sit next to me? Well, on that night, uh, the Lord did not hear my humble cry. All right. The Lord did not answer by and by. She did not sit next to me. She sat behind me. And she started talking. I mean, she started talking about President Obama, how great he was, how much he enjoyed his presidency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I said, okay, she's talking real good. But then she switched the topic of her conversation. Yeah, yeah. She stopped talking about President Obama and started talking about John Lewis. I said, John Lewis got big lips, big nose. And I said, hold on a second, I've got big lips. I've got a big, why y'all laughing? Y'all got big lips and big nose too. Uh, uh, and so, and so she, was, she was talking, 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 and I got tired of hearing her talk. And so I said, ma'am, please stop talking about John Lewis in that way. I said, ma'am, the only reason we are sat here at the front of the plane and not in the back somewhere is because God used people like John Lewis to be productive on our behalf. I said, ma'am, please stop talking about John Lewis in that way. The only reason you can vote is because of John Lewis. I said, ma'am, where were you when John Lewis was far? and host down in Selma, Alabama. I said, ma'am, where were you when John Lewis was put in jail? I said, ma'am, the only reason we are who we are today is because God used people like John Lewis. And all I'm trying to teach you on tonight is the only reason you are sat in your seat and the only reason you are clothed in your rightful mind and the only reason you are here on today is because God, through Christ, was production unto you. Jesus was productive before he got here. He was the co-creator. He was productive as a child. He grew in wisdom, in knowledge, and favor with God and man. He was productive in leading 12 hard-headed disciples. He was productive in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was productive on the old rugged cross. He was productive in an old borrowed tomb. Do I have a witness here? And he's productively interceding for me. I can have victory because I can be productive. I have joy because I can be productive. I have peace because I can be productive. Please stop pressuring me. I just want to be productive. And if you want to be productive, you want to stand on your feet and say, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continue. My soul shall make his boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Do I have a witness here who can open up their mouth and clap their hands and say, People try to kill me, try to take me out. 
death trying to stop me from building. But through the power of God, I will be productive. Somebody say yes. Somebody say yes. Somebody say yes. I feel all right now. I feel better now. Burdens down, Lord. Burdens down, Lord. Since I made my burdens down. Say yes. Say yes. Praise God for the pressure in our lives. Certainly, we want to extend an invitation to one who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. We're here today bidding and begging you to come. Thank God we have a God who knows what to do with pressure. But he provides even in the midst of pressure. If you're here today, the greatest thing that God has ever provided was salvation through the Son, Jesus Christ. Dealing with pressure, he died, but yet he lives. If you're here today, if you're here today, if you're here today, God bless you. God keep you. That be a great amen. amen. What a mighty word from this preacher. Well, Y'all saying it kind of dry. What a mighty word from this preacher. I don't know, I don't know about you, but I sure don't like nobody nagging me. Mm, don't try to stop progress. I like for folks to be pushing you on. So I want to thank God for this preaching. Yes, thank you for spending this last hour with us. We are eternally grateful. This evangelical board will be all the greater because of what you have invested in us. So tonight, as we bid you good night and uh, safe passage to your various destination. I've had a ball being here in San Antonio. I mean, I went out and got in the sun today. Because when I thought about what I'm going to face tomorrow in Chicago, I said, let me sop up as much sun as I can get. Amen. But we've certainly had a ball here in San Antonio. Uh, our, our chief, uh, Dr. Woods, who could not be with us this week, is just on pins and needles because he couldn't be present. But you have made even the fact that he couldn't be here all the better out of your support. Shall we stand? Now may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance round about you and grant you peace, Donna Nobis Pancho, may he bless you coming out, may he bless you coming in, may he bless you in your labor and in your leisure, in your rising up and your setting down. Morning and the evening and at noon until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.